this is this is a paper uh, as as <laughs> Paul said I'm working on, on a book that has the kind of working joke title a bit pervious to others I could call it feeling others um, but I don't think any press is going to love any of those options maybe permeable is going to work anyway I'm still on the hunt for a plausible title um, but actually pervious to others describes exactly what the topic is and then that's this idea that we are that we're highly sensitive to others reactions to us and the others reactions to us transform and change our relationship to ourselves so what it's like to 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 be a person a, a, an animal it can be changed by another animal just looking at you and doing other things so my topic today is is laughing at people it's a sort of common uh, it's a joy of human life the way in which groups of people laugh together and laugh at each other um, but it can also be a sort of burden of human life uh, to be the object of others laughter and I want to kind of explore what it is we might be doing when <laughs> when we laugh at each other okay let me just start by saying I'm the part of this I mean there are, lot, there, there are a number of things we might be doing but I'm particularly interested in the in looking at acts of acts of what I call making feel acts that have as their goal and intention a transformation of a feeling in another um, we're very used to seeing in the in the um, in philosophy, in a philosophy of mind, in epistemology, in political philosophy, in ethics, we're very used to seeing discussions of cognitive change, actions that aim at cognitive change in others, acts of testimony and, and persuasion and so on. And we're very used to thinking about cases of actions aimed at agential change in others that, well, other when I persuade you to act rather than persuade you to believe, when I threaten you, <coughs> when I do a number of other things I might be kind of have as my purpose in acting, not just that I transform the world in some way, but I get you to transform the world in some way. Um, so I want to bring into view acts of what we can think of as effective change, act where uh, we, we determine what to do and we have as our goal making someone feel something. Now there are just you know too many kinds of acts of making feel for, for me to explore properly here. I mean it starts very very <laughs> early so, so you know pinchings and punchings and ticklings and strokings uh, are all acts that are aimed to produce certain forms of bodily sensation but they're deliberate acts sometimes comforting calming amusing all these can be acts where somebody's trying to bring about a feeling of comfort in someone else or a feeling of peacefulness or amusement in in someone else I'm going to look at um, two kinds of acts that I think are acts of making feel. Um, one very briefly really just to get a bit of structure as to how one might think and talk about these things and then the other is a, a sort of the, I take it the more, um, it's not the more complicated case, it's the case I'm more interested in and so I spend sort of longer on it. Um, so I'm going to look at acts of threatening and acts of diminishing and I want to say that certain forms of acts of threatening and certain forms of acts of diminishing so in certain cases they are we should understand them as acts of making feel understood as acts that aim to inculcate a certain emotion or feeling in in another okay so my first um, sort of case is 
the, the actions that are aimed at inducing fear through threat. So let's say I want to frighten somebody. I start, it's somehow purposeful for me, useful for me, if somebody's frightened. Um, I'm not going to cook up a, a case beyond that. Um, there's two ways I could do it. I could introduce something uh, threatening, dangerous in their environment and a sort of hope and assume that they're going to be responsive to the fact that there's something threatening or dangerous in an environment. So if I want to frighten someone, I could let loose a dangerous dog in, there, in the room that they're in. I could do that, and I could do that successfully without the agent who I'm trying to make frightened know that I'm up to anything. As far as they're concerned, it might be an accident that a dangerous dog is in their environment. But there's another kind of way of we, <coughs> another kind of act where you can aim at making someone feel fearful, where, which seems to have a sort of different quality, and that's the kind of acts of threatening to do something to someone. Right? I mean, very often I think it's worth pointing out that acts of threatening or acts of making feel, but, but also acts of agential change. So very often, you're trying to get someone to do something in virtue of being frightened of something. But I just want to narrow the, the focus a bit and look at, at acts of <coughs> the making them feel frightened. Now, acts of threatening need not in themselves as it were, be, be threatening. You can threaten someone and absolutely fail to pose a danger or a threat. Um, and looking at, as it were, what... I promised myself to say, I stopped saying as it were, but anyway. Um, you could, looking at, at uh, these cases, it's clear that quite a lot of architecture is required in order for a threat to be successful. So you need something like the threatener to, um, to be recognised by the target as having the intent to carry through. So when you say to your children for the 50th time, you know, if you don't do that, I will take your favourite whatever and put it in the bin. <coughs> and they go, yeah, she's I've never done that. She might have threatened it, but she's never done it. And then the threat doesn't work. Um, it's also the threatener is recognised by the target as not having the ability to carry through. So if a two-year-old you know, threatens to hurt you, and you think, well, they, they mean it all right, but they couldn't do it if they tried, then that's going to be a failed threat. Um, now, a successful threat doesn't just rely on these conditions being met, I think, by the person doing the threatening. They also relies on conditions with the, the person being threatened. They need to recognise the um, act as... as, as uh, as presenting some kind of harm or danger in virtue of recognising um, uh, the ability to carry through and the, and the intent. OK, so that, I think, that, that, that gives you a certain kind of um, case study of the ways in which the capacities of one agent and the sort of liabilities of the target agent can both be brought into bear to make sense of whether or not we've got one of these successful acts. Okay, now, but I want to look at and I want to focus for the rest of the talk on acts of making someone feel diminished and in particular making someone feel diminished through laughing at them. So I want to back up a little bit and just think about what philosophers have said 
about what what laugh what laughing at someone could be about like what what are human do, beings doing uh, when they laugh at others so aristotle remarked that the laughable so this is what's sort of funny consists in some blunder or ag ugliness that does not cause pain or disaster so for simplicity let's call such blunders and ugliness failure right why do we why do we laugh at those things i mean setting let's assume that something like well, it's a separate question, I think, why that's funny, but let's assume that that's something funny. Why do we laugh? So here are two quotations that, that it seems to me very striking and put together give us one kind of story about what we might be doing when we laugh at someone. So here's Paul Karras. So I think, I mean, there aren't, <laughs> there aren't that many pieces on laughing in philosophy, but there is a piece by Paul Karras. Can it be anything else than a shout of triumph, the loud announcement of a victory and an expression of joy at success of some kind? And this is Scruton. If people dislike being laughed at, it's surely because laughter devalues the object in the subject's eyes. So I want to suggest if we put these together, we get something like what I call competition. That there's a kind of competition between human beings, or can be a kind of competition between human beings for social value. Um, <coughs> and that we can make sense of, uh, that this fact gives us an explanation for why X laughs at Y's failures. Because in laughing at Y, X is devaluing Y and expressing delight in their relative success. So the idea is that an act uh, of laughing has both a kind of devaluing uh, component and a kind of delighting at competitive <coughs> advantage. Um, moment. Note that this gives us a sort of, well, we, we've, uh, that we need some sort of explanation. So mutual recognition of failure doesn't seem to be enough to give us an expression of why we laugh. I mean, if, you know, if you, agree, you and I both agree that you're just much better at something we're competing over, um, then, then there's no sort of further thing that needs to be done to settle the competition. We both agreed on that. So that just, just the facts of sort of social competition don't, I think, give you an answer to why, why we laugh. And I want to suggest that, so suppose I recognise your blunder and you recognise your blunder and we both recognise that your blunder is your loss and my game in the competition for social value. So that's my question. What could laughing add? And my answer is that the laughing itself could have the function of itself devaluing an object in a subject size. The laughing itself has a, a, the, the capacity to, as it were, fix social value, not just be a case of sort of recognizing the social values uh, that exist. How, why does laughing do that? How does laughing do that? Well, I think there's three things we could look at. It makes the, f <coughs> it makes the failure common knowledge. You know, you know and I know. Maybe you know, I know. Maybe I know, you know. But, but that's not enough for it to be common knowledge between us, sort of out in the open between us that there's a failure. It marks... A, a blunder or failure as socially significant. And indeed, it marks any feature as socially significant, whether you'd antecedently consider it a failure or a blunder or not. Right? The, power, the laughter can actually mark something out as 
socially significant and worthy of being laughed at because it's ridiculous, even if it's not ridiculous. And, and in the so laughing, if the laugh, laugher has that kind of social capacity, can make it actually socially significant. OK, there are many different ways we can have of devaluing or socially diminishing someone. You know, we, we can make them poor. We can silence them. We can make them immobile. And, you know, infinite varieties of of uh, humans have to be able to diminish others. Okay, so, well, I, I, but I think what's going on in the laughter case is we've got socially diminishing by making someone feel themselves to be diminished. And part of what makes this possible is that social value, something like price, is dependent on our expressed evaluations of it each other and not only our actual worth, moral or ethical worth. And laughing, laughing at someone can be a signification of something, there being something counting as devaluing about what the person's doing. So this my suggestion we take laughing at someone's failure to be an act aimed at making them feel something about themselves in particular, making them feel so free to diminish. Now, actually, it's English, at least, is replete with um, verbs for act types that are indicative of, as it were, social raising and hiring, right? I, I think if we, if we, or at least in certain uses of them. So sneering, jeering, shaming, humiliating, mocking, most sort of literally putting down Right? We put people down. Um, raising acts also. It's not all diminution. Praising, lauding, flattering, honouring. My favourite, bigging up. Right? I love the sort of volumetric ideas that social magnitude is a kind of thing you can, you can change with these raising and lowering acts. Now, let me just note a complication before I go on. I think very often, well, there are two kinds of case that we need to separate. Two, there are two kinds of case, but they can both be done at the same time, right? We can seek to diminish someone by making them feel diminished, say, by laughing at them. But we can also seek to diminish another by making a witness feel that the target rather than them is diminished. So very often, I think, laughing's at somebody actually have as their goal the attitudes of the audience rather than the laughed at person. Now, I think often we're just doing both things at once. We're both, as it were, publicly, in cases of public laughing, we're both trying to make the person feel diminished and thereby diminishing them. And we're, as it were, we've got this other um, a concordant aim of uh, making others see their diminution and therefore the rest of us feel uh, uh, in some way raised. Or super, you get the, the superiority. But I'm going to slightly try and keep things simple to keep the sort of audience case out. It's rather hard to do that because it does come back in, but, but I, uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Let me say something about standing. I think the power to diminish by laughing uh, is, is, is hugely various and depends and hugely contextual in, in lots of ways. But one thing I think can play a role is in, 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 in enabling a subject to be able to diminish a, a, a somebody by laughing at them, is that they have the standing to declare a failure as socially significant. So there are occasions where some people will have the sign of social capacity or power in a situation, whereby they do need to do no more 
than laugh at somebody irrespective of whether or not there's something laughable there um, <coughs> in order to diminish them. I mean, I think there are complicated and interesting cases, and perhaps we can come back to this in, in uh, the, uh, the questions, but there is a kind of superpower that people can have in certain kinds of social situation which enable them to, on the basis of nothing, change the social values that are operative in a, in a room. OK, so um, I'm going to end by suggesting that once we recognize that there are acts of this type that have this kind of social function and operate in this way, then it's rational for a subject who's the target of such uh, a, an act to feel diminished if they recognize that the aim of the laughing is to diminish and to claim superiority for the laughter, that the laughter has the power to determine our actual social relations in such a way, and if I have an effective capacity to be sensitive to such changes in such social relations. Some people are just, I mean, fabulously sort of immune to the power of others to put them down or diminish them. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. But many human beings aren't wonderfully immune to, to that. And I don't think it's irrational not to be immune. <laughs> so I think the kind of, um, oh, don't be upset, they're only joking, right, somehow is, is a failure to understand that it can be really rational. It can be rational given your certain kind of sensitivities and given the, the relations between persons in a particular environment. OK, um, incorporation. Uh, so to try to make sense of this capacity somebody has to make somebody else feel diminished, I mean, just actually quite generally, to make sense of this capacity that in some way you can um, come to change a relation to yourself and your social condition um, by incorporating a, an expression of your value from another person. That's a sort of puzzling and amazing thing about human beings, that we, that we are so liable to, to be, uh, that we're so permeable, that we're so pervious to, to others, that we incorporate into our sense of ourself. You know, you can think someone's a complete, you know, I said I'd try not to swear. Bark. You can think you can think someone's a complete bark, and they never they can, and you can not value their opinions about anything, but they can you know laugh at you or or, or uh, set on you in a in a certain or put you try and put you down in a certain way, and you can come to incorporate their sense of you in your sense of yourself. And I think we need to make sense of this. I mean, what we need to make sense of is something like a person, say, the laughed at, um, coming to be conscious of herself from the laughers' perspective. OK. And this, I mean, th how this works needs to be unpacked carefully. And I'm not really going to unpack it fully here, but I just note that neither of the following two things is sort of sufficient. So I don't think we can make sense of this just by imaginative projection. So A, imagining herself occupying the position occupied by the laugher, B, and laughing at herself. That doesn't seem to be enough, because here we just have the laughed at subject imagining laughing at herself. And uh, the sort of other possibility, in, if we think about it in terms of imaginative projection, is we have A imagining B being B laughing at 
a failing or faulty or bumbling A, but here we have the subject just imagining being another subject laughing at someone who's in fact herself. So I think it's not a philosophically straightforward task to make sense of this kind of intersubjective structure that allows a transformation of our self-consciousness as, as a result of, as it were, incorporating the other's view of me. For now, read my book. For now, it doesn't fully exist, but uh, for now, <laughs> she said for the third time, um, I'm just going to assume that we have... I mean, I actually think what it's not going, you're not going to be get, able to get a satisfying philosophical account of this if you only look at sort of cognitive structures of, of Im a, a, an imagination. You're going to need something like affective or emotional structures. But for now, I'm going to assume that we have an evolved capacity for affective self-consciousness that both transforms the subjects relating to herself through some kind of psychobodily change and has the function of being a conduit for the evaluations by attentive others. Right? That's what human beings are like. That's what they were built to do. They have emotional or affective capacities, the function of which is to make themselves feel a certain way in response to a an evaluation from another. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, that's a suggestion about what's going on when we look at certain laughings at failure. But it's worth noting, and, he and here I'm going to, I, I, I want to bring out the extent to which sort of, I think that in fact, <laughs> despite my title, there's no answer to the question, what are we doing when we laugh at others, right? It's in a way an ill-formed question because the act type laughing at others can be realised very differently in very different contents. So dif distinct laughings at others can do any number of things. But here's a problem, straightforward problem, to the idea that... Um, laughings at failure are all already diminishing. I mean, one thing that's notable is that we invite people to laugh at us, right? Very often we, I think I've done it about four times actually, uh, very often we, we, as it were, advertise our ridiculousness and we invite, invite people to, to laugh at us. And if all laughing at failure is carrying out an act of social diminution, then we might wonder what, you know, how that affects these cases of where you invite someone to laugh at you. So my inviting others to laugh at my failure, is that inviting them to diminish me? Is it a form of sort of self-harm? My accepting an invitation to laugh at someone's failure um, is that me accepting an invitation to diminish them? So I think it's interesting to think about the relationship between these kind of invitations to laugh at and, and consent. So should we think of them as acts like stealing? So what act you're carrying out can be determined or it can be impossible given certain kind of structures of consent, for example, that exist. So stealing or sexually assaulting as such that they become impossible by invitation and consent, understood carefully and in the right way. So an invited transfer of property is not a theft. If I say, you know, here, have my Fitbit. You can't... That was an example. You see, it wasn't an offering of a Fitbit. Um, that was a giving of an example. But anyway, um, you could, that, it couldn't be, a, it couldn't be a, a theft if you took it. Um, and an invited kiss is not a sexual assault. So is an invited laughing at my failure similarly precluded from being an act of social diminution? Or is laughing at failure more like a punch? Like still, still a punch with attendant pain and bruises, 
just an expected one if I laugh it. I think there are cases and cases, actually. So here's a really nice quotation from the um, comedian Hannah Gadsby. I've built a career out of self-deprecating humour, and I don't want to do that anymore because, do you understand, do you understand what self-deprecation means when it comes from someone who already exists in the margins? It's not humility, it's humiliation. So she invites the idea that sometimes when somebody's inviting somebody to laugh at them, the consent doesn't like, alter the act that's carried out. In some way, it can still be a, a diminishing act. And I think it's really interesting to think about what kind of cases that might be true of. But I also think that it's fairly plausible that most of the time, we're doing something else when we invite someone to laugh at, at us. We're not setting up a circumstance whereby we're socially diminishing ourselves. In fact, very often, I think, acts of invitations to laugh at us are kind of, I mean, they can be, they can be sort of self-inflating, right? They can be self-aggrandizing. Look at me, I don't need you to think good things about me because I'm sort of immune to that. Um, so I think it's, I don't think there's any straight uh, answer to, I, don't, I think consent can make a difference to whether or not we've got a, an act of social diminution here, but it very often we don't have uh, cons uh, an act of, of self-diminution. OK, it's also worth noting that we laugh at ourselves when we're alone. It doesn't require audiences, right? So one, I assume all of us, have at times caught ourselves in absurd situation or make a ridiculous mistake, and you sit and you laugh at your stupidity or absurdity or ridiculousness. Um, and it's quite, it's slightly hard to think how we could characterize those as acts of social diminution. I mean, you could have something like a sort of competition, so go, going back to competition, it could be have something like competition between selves over time. Like, you know, she was a schmuck who put her phone in the fridge, but now I found it, <laughs> you know, and then I have the crow of social advantage over my past selves. It doesn't, it doesn't seem a, I mean, it's not that I don't sometimes delight in my things that I'm now doing a bit better than I was doing before. Um, most of the time I'm miserable at things, I'm doing worse than I was doing before. But it doesn't seem as though that's really gonna capture most cases of laughing at oneself. I suppose it could be I mean, the other point, sort of simple point, is that you can be laughing at yourself, as it were, at the time that you're doing the absurd thing. So unless you're slicing yourselves extremely thinly, it's not going to quite work. It could be parts of myself. I mean, it could be, you know, my rational soul is somehow laughing at my desirous, appetitive soul who's um, absurdly covered her face in chocolate at the speed at which she's eating or something like that. You could have that kind of case, but I think, I think we should think about something else that we might be doing when we're laughing at ourselves. On sort of the section three of the handout is like a, a, a little kind of uh, nod to, well, sort of rile, really, on action theory. But the that, and, I, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I, I just want to point out that laughing at X's failure must apply to different kinds of laughing. It's not surprising. So laughing at failure is a very thin description. Assuming laughing is something like 
This is, this is from Moriel, I, I love it. A combination of bodily events, including the spasmodic expulsion of air from the lungs, accompanying sounds, characteristic facial distortions. So laughing is understood as that kind of bodily response uh, at, at sort of in, the, in, the, in response to a failure. You could be doing any number of things. That's an extremely thin description of what somebody might be up to. So, so just understood as a, an act type, laughing at others. I think we shouldn't be remotely surprised if individual laughings at others or act types of very, very different kinds. So what other kind of act type could the laughing at myself uh, case. Let's look at the case where I'm not inviting others to laugh, but I'm just laughing at, at myself. Well, here's something we do. I mean, this here's something we do as, as reflective human uh, beings, thinking about our condition. We, we reflect on our absurdity. We reflect on our kind of passionate and sincere pursuit of things that we know we won't kind of manage. And we, and we also, I mean, you know, if we read too much Thomas Nagel, we might, we might start to think, does anything, does anything I do count at all for anything? I mean, I'm just a little bundle of kind of soggy particles in a massive universe. Um, I mean, you don't have to go that far to think, you know, when, I, when, when, you're, when you're preparing for a talk on the train and you're trying not to see the, you know, the discoveries of the, the bomb theatre in, in Ukraine, you, you, you can feel absurd. I mean, you can actually just feel immoral, but you can also feel absurd. It can seem like a sort of ridiculous of human life that we passionately... So I think that's sometimes why we laugh at ourselves. We, we take a reflective point of view and note our failures and sometimes celebrate in them. It's a sort of relief from our serious intent. If that's a sort of recognisable human activity, then I think you can start to say something a bit different about what's going on when we invite others to laugh at failure. Um, we, can, we can do... I mean, here's the, here's the thing that, that it's really hard to do, as it were, together, and that is uh, each of us as it were, reflect on the ridiculousness of our position, the, the, the fragility of our social values, their, their, um, their changeability, their groundlessness very often. Um, it's very often hard to do that as, as a group, but what you can do is sort of do it, do it in your own case. Because you can't, it's hard to do it as a group, because if you start saying to somebody else, you're not wearing those ridiculous shoes again, ha, 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 or whatever, then, no, well, that wasn't about you, Paul. Um, actually, our shoes are strangely similar. But anyway, you're not, you know, you could, then you're laughing at someone and you're you, you might be diminishing. But if you do it, as it were, to yourself, that's a way of saying, we're not going to think, we're not going to count that stuff right and you're inviting someone to do it, as it were, in their own name. So here's one thing we might be doing if we're, if we're inviting others to laugh at failure. I can reveal my failure and, all, and thereby express my insouciance about it in my preparedness to share it. Right, I declare myself. This is what I call <laughs> the Johnny Vegas mood. Right, this is, I'm going to have to swear now. Um, Johnny Vegas has got this brilliant thing. He says, you know, it's quite embarrassing when you go to the loo and you get, like, pee on your trousers. He didn't say pee, obviously. Um, when you get pee on, he said, and there's only one solution, to walk out of the loo and go, oh, no, I've got pee on my trousers, right? 
So thereby sort of negating the embarrassingness of the. So you express your insouciance at your preparedness to share it. And I exploit a universality in the first person reflective point of view and implicitly invite others to reflect on their own condition and laugh at themselves and their faultiness. And in doing that, I knew can neutralize the power of others to diminish by laughing at failure. It can be a way of declaring it. So failure isn't socially diminishing around here. So it's a way of sort of, I think, resisting the norms of social evaluation that are actually operative in successful diminishing cases. I think that's obviously what's going on in, perhaps not Hannah Gadsby, but it's obviously what's going on in lots and lots of sort of stand-up comedy and so on, which are sort of more or less formal forms of invitations to to laugh at failure, but I think it's, I think it's not only those cases, I think it's informal structures um, can be made sense of in this way. Okay, I want to end um, by suggest, well I want to, uh, so, I want to look at a f another case. I've been looking at consented to laughings and tried to suggest that they can be, um, that they can operate in ways that resist certain forms of, as it were, social amplification and diminution. And I, I now want to look at non-invited laughings. Okay, we worried earlier about whether it's possible to invite socially diminishing laughings. I want to now ask kind of whether it's possible for non-invited laughings at failure to be able to, uh, to be acts that resist norms of social evaluation. You might think, when I laugh at the ridiculousness of myself, that's something I'm allowed to do, but I can't do it with somebody else, except Paul. Um, I can't do it with somebody else. And I want to actually suggest that non-consented to laughings at failure can and often are, particularly in contexts of intimacy and care, are, can be laughings that, that don't diminish, but also actually serve to undermine the power of failure in fixing the value in the first place. So let me try and, I mean, the cases on this are really difficult. I mean, I think, you know, because they're people, I have given cases like that, and people have said, no, you're just horrible, right? <laughs> you're just horrible to laugh at that. But here's, here's one case, um, is that, you know, I just, I just used to laugh at my children's mistakes when they were growing up. You know, when my, do when my daughter said, <gasps> oh, I really want some high-wheeled shoes. I just thought that was hilarious. I mean, and it's kind of funny, but I, I laughed on two ways. It's funny and it's a mistake, right? And we, we would laugh. And she didn't hate it. And I don't think, <laughs> I think it was a way of, of adding kind of delight to our family affairs. And it was both appreciated because it was an interesting mistake, but it was a mistake, and so it's a way. So I think lots of education actually involves us bringing pleasure to and allowing that there can be kind of hilarious errors you can make. So that's my, that's my um, one example. I mean, there are other cases that I just remember as a, <laughs> I mean, this is a sort of reciprocal case, and you might think that that sort of changes it. So I remember as a child, my mother asking me and my sister to go and get a chicken from the butcher to pick it up. And it was pouring, absolutely, you know, raining, those proper sort of monsoon type rains with the puddles fill up. And we were kind of going back with this blasted chicken from, from the butcher. And my sister slipped and fell in a puddle. And I laughed 
so loudly that I slipped and fell in the same puddle. And we sat with this chicken between us, sort of howling, howling. Now, she didn't invite me to laugh at her. I laughed at her fall. And it would I don't think it would have been a terrible thing to do had I not fallen too. Um, anyway, so, th so there's, and here's, a, here's a more complicated uh, case. I mean, I, I had a case, so I was interested in, in the way in which, in, in, in sort of, in, in, around illness, that idea that people laugh around illness, laugh at it, and I think that's often a, 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 a reversal, it's a way of incorporating failure into uh, as an acceptable part rather than a problematic part of our social environment. So you'll, you maybe you'll think this, this is just appalling, but my mum's really ill and um, she sometimes falls into sort of um, deep, deep sleeps, sort of almost unconscious. And she says things like, she doesn't quite say, I no longer exist. But she says, I'm no longer here, which if you're a philosopher who works on the first person <laughs> and the cogito, I mean, I don't howl, but I do kind of titter a little bit. Now, it's true that she can't, and, and I'll sort of say, Mum, you must be here because you're speaking to me. <laughs> anyway, I don't, I, I want to suggest that, that actually, in human relations, there's a lot more scope for, as it were, the new mutual recognition of, as it were, our faultiness. And we can use that both to, as it were, discount and to, uh, uh, and, and to magnify for, for, for considerations of social value. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop there. <laughs>